So I wanted to revisit this topic a little bit more because I think I have something new to say this time. Yes, you got that right. We're going to be talking a bit about gravity on the flat earth and how it works, whatever that is. Of course, in real life, gravity as we experience it is due to the mass of the earth, which attracts things to the center of it. It's also why things like planets are generally roundish, because gravity squishes it into that shape. Of course, a bit of an oversimplification here, but what I want to know is how flat earthers, with their density argument, can fit this into real life, and that's what we're going to find out today. Long before the theory of gravity was a glimmer in Isaac Newton's imagination, the natural physics of density and buoyancy already perfectly explained why apples fall down. Quite simply, objects fall or rise based on their relative density to the medium surrounding them. Apples fall because they are denser than the air, while helium balloons rise because they are lighter. No gravity necessary. This is why raindrops fall down through the air, and air bubbles rise up through water. Everything seeks its relative density, and rises or falls until settling accordingly. Okay, so we've seen all of this before, but I wanted to show you the clip anyway in case you've forgotten what their argument was. I mean, why would I? I don't find it entertaining, educational, nor worth my time. So before making this video, I actually simply just forgot what argument they made for why things fall to the ground. I completely forgot about this density nonsense. Anyway, the main argument I always use was why do things go down and not up or sideways? Although this is the main argument I used, honestly, there are better arguments out there, which is why we're revisiting this topic again. Anyway, finally, a flat earther has responded to this which we'll get to in just a bit. Submarines float on the surface when their ballast tanks are filled with air. But when the vents are opened and seawater floods in, they begin to sink as the submarine's density becomes greater than water. We can also prove this fact of relative density by filling a plastic balloon with approximately half helium and half air. Since helium is lighter than the oxygen, nitrogen, and other gases that compose the air around us, Filling a balloon with just the right amount of helium to compensate for and balance out the density of the plastic results in a gravity-defying, levitating balloon at equilibrium that neither rises nor falls. Yeah, but you see, this is a useless idea to point out because it doesn't disprove the concept of gravity. In order for your argument to have any value, you need to provide something that not only proves your point, but also disproves other ideas that challenge your own. Actually, scratch that part about proving your own position. Show me something that disproves the concept of gravity, because until you do that, nothing you say has any value. Skeptics often ask, if gravity doesn't exist, and objects simply fall down because they are denser than the medium surrounding them, why do objects of varying masses all fall at the same rate? If there is no gravity, why does a helium balloon fall down in a vacuum chamber? And without gravity, why exactly do things fall downwards when dropped, rather than upwards or sideways? Yes, very good questions. So there are two main concerns here. The first one I've asked a lot. Why do things go down instead of any other direction? And number two, why is it that density doesn't matter in terms of the speed in which something falls? Here's a challenge for you. Take an object, maybe a rock or something, and let's say drop it at, I don't know, one meter high. Now please calculate using your idea of gravity what the speed of that rock will be when it hits the ground. And then of course we can measure it multiple times to see if it's actually right. How are you as a flat earther going to proceed with this? Of course there's a famous constant we use 9.8 meters per second per second to measure the acceleration of gravity, and when we use this equation, 10 out of 10 times we're going to measure correctly what the speed of that rock will be when it hits the floor, and how long it will take. In this hypothetical example, it will take about 0.45 seconds, and it will have a velocity of approximately 4.4 meters per second. Of course, it's going to be slightly plus or minus a small amount due to varying factors such as initial velocity and air resistance, but in general, that's going to be true. And using this equation and the acceleration of gravity, we can change the object and change the height, and that that will always hold true as long as we are on Earth. So you literally cannot get away from this equation. If I ask you to calculate the time and speed just like I did above, you will have to use the same equation because nothing else works and that equation is dependent on gravity. Okay, you might say that 9.8 meters per second per second is not gravity, it's just the property of density or whatever the fuck that is. Okay, let's give you that for the sake of argument. In that case, where is density in this equation? Where is it? Because it's not there. You'll notice that we can always calculate the speed of an object upon hitting the ground and the time it takes to hit the ground regardless of the density of the object. It doesn't matter, which is why a golf ball and a bowling ball will hit the ground at approximately the same time if dropped on the same height. Suppose you drop a golf ball and a bowling ball from the Empire State Building. 
Which hits first? Answer? They hit at the same time. Let's see what your response to this is. To begin with, a feather and an anvil will both fall at different rates because one is radically denser than the medium surrounding, air, while the other is not. Well, that's actually not true. The feather falls at a different rate because of air resistance. The feather is designed to catch onto air and keep it afloat, whereas an anvil does not, which is why if you drop a feather in a vacuum chamber, it falls at the same rate. But even if we don't use a feather, again, a golf ball and a bowling ball will fall at the same rate as well, so your statement is just false and misleading. Imagine a dandelion seed and a brick, or a piece of paper and a boulder. These examples and many others fall at drastically different rates, debunking the supposed uniform speed of acceleration due to gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. You are literally taking examples of objects that would drastically be affected by air resistance. A feather, a piece of paper, and a dandelion seed would all be greatly affected due to the design of those objects catching as much air as possible when it is falling. Which is why this is completely dishonest because air resistance should be held constant for both objects if we were to honestly experiment this. Of course, a golf ball and a bowling ball will be affected by air resistance differently, but the difference isn't too significant which is why we can use these objects. And that's why they hit the ground at the same time as I mentioned earlier. In a vacuum chamber, the medium of air is removed completely, so all objects, including a feather and a bowling ball, will fall at this same maximum rate. By removing the medium from the equation altogether, all objects, including a helium balloon, will fall to the ground simultaneously. Without any medium to move through, the fall rate of all objects is indeed equal, but this has nothing to do with some mythical attractive pulling force and everything to do with the fact that the density of the surrounding medium has been reduced to zero. Therefore, in reality, since a feather, bowling ball, or anything else inside a vacuum chamber is infinitely denser than empty space, which has a density of zero, it all falls at the same rate of 9.81 meters per second squared. Ah, I see what you're trying to do here. So now you're arguing that because in a vacuum chamber there's no medium to travel through, everything falls at the same rate, and you're treating the non-existent medium here as a density of zero. First of all, that doesn't explain why a golf ball and a bowling ball hits the ground at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, since they're both moving through air and the bowling ball is much more dense. Second of all, the fact that you're treating a non-existent medium as zero density is just ridiculous. In that case, let me propose another question to you. We saw the feather and the ball fall at the same rate, and treating a non-existent medium as zero would technically make sense in your density argument, but what if we replace the objects with air? By your definition, air is at least denser than nothing, so in that case, air should fall to the ground. Or if you're so nitpicky about the difference between an object and a medium, would helium also just hit the ground since it is denser than quote nothing? You used it in a balloon example earlier after all. And then if you think about it, everywhere on earth is like that. If you're in a room, even if the room is empty, technically it's still air versus the non-existent medium, in which case air should always just fall and stick to the ground according to your definition. But yet that's not what happens, which completely destroys your position and how you're thinking about feathers and vacuums earlier. As for why objects fall downwards when dropped, rather than upwards or sideways, firstly, there is a pressure gradient formed by the amount of stacked air, water, and land over you in a column, which increases the pressure, weight, and density the farther down you go, and that defines direction. No, the pressure gradient is determined because of that force, it's not the determiner of that force's direction. Whatever the force is, call it gravity or density difference or whatever, it creates that pressure difference because it's pushing everything towards that direction, not the other way around. If you truly think that this so-called pressure difference determines the direction, then tell me, why is the pressure gradient in this direction specifically? Why is it that downwards is higher pressure and upwards is lower? And even if that's just magically the case without any explanation, why does that even determine the direction of which object fall. Scientifically speaking, logically speaking, how does that determine it at all? Secondly, helium balloons fall up, not down, proving there is no downward directional bias. No, but there is. Helium balloons go up due to your definition because it's quote less dense. Why do more dense objects go down and less dense objects go up? This is clearly a situation in which a direction has been strictly established. You can also prove this point by throwing various kinds of rocks, including pumice, into a pond. All rocks, excluding the pumice stone, will sink to the bottom. 
but then when you throw in the pumice, it will rise right back to the surface. This is because pumice has a density less than water, just like helium balloons have a density less than air. Okay, you're literally just repeating the same point over and over again without actually answering the question. Why do more dense objects move down instead of, say, sideways? What's determining that direction? Their relative density, being lower than the medium surrounding, causes them to rise, just as things with a relative density higher than the medium surrounding causes them to fall. This is all perfectly explained by the natural physics of density and buoyancy, which was well known and understood long before Sir Newton renamed and remodeled it to fit with his heliocentric theory of the cosmos. Okay, so you just dodged the question and didn't answer it whatsoever. I guess flat earthers are good at that. Yes, we've heard you explain your stupid density argument a dozen times already. We just want to know how direction is determined and why more dense objects fall downwards instead of any other direction. You can't answer that because there is no answer, because your entire model is wrong. Learn to take the L instead of making up explanations that completely dodge the question. You'll only appear to be more stupid that way. Thanks for watching everyone, and thank you to Fireshard, Alan Morton, Miss Fixit, and Rick Clan, and I'll see you in the next one.